to start, I want to talk about the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. When we're talking about microevolution, we're talking about evolution on a smaller scale, hence the prefix micro. So, so far, we've just been looking at the evolution of populations. So we've been looking at the changes in allele frequencies over time in populations, which indicates that they're evolving. Now, before I move on and talk about macroevolution, I want to note that populations are the smallest unit that can evolve. A single organism cannot evolve. So whenever there's changes made to the phenotype of an organism, we do not say the organism has evolved. Now, when we're talking about macroevolution, we're studying the evolution and the changing of species over a bigger period of time, over a longer period of time, hence the prefix macro, because macro means large or big. Before we get into the evolution of species, let's make sure you know the difference between population and species. A population is just a group of similar organisms that are all within the same habitat. As for species, there's actually a biological definition of what is a species. So scientists actually sat down and came up with a definition of a species so that we can all categorize the same way whether we have two organisms and they're the same species or they're different species. So there's three criteria for organisms to be within the same species. One, they have to mate in nature. Two, they must produce viable, and that just simply means normal offspring, offspring that are going to develop normally, not have any problems surviving. And three, those offspring also have to be fertile. They have to have the ability to have offspring themselves. So let's take a look at some examples here of two different types of organisms, and we're going to indicate whether they're the same species or different. So a donkey and a horse. In nature, a donkey and a horse will mate. If you put them in the same pasture, it's going to happen. And they're going to have offspring. The offspring is called a mule. And the mule develops normally into an adult organism. So, so far, we're meeting two of those three criteria. But the problem with the mule is that they're infertile. They cannot have offspring. So we say that the donkey and the horse are two different species. If we have a beef cow and a dairy cow. So beef cows are used mostly for the production of meat. And dairy cows, they usually live longer because we just use them to produce milk. Are they the same species or different species? Well, they will mate in nature. They will have offspring. And the offspring can have offspring as well. So they're considered the same species. A tiger and a lion. If you have ever watched Napoleon Dynamite, he was obsessed with the liger. There is such a thing as a liger. It's a cross between a tiger and a lion, obviously. The thing is, though, this doesn't happen in nature. They're on two different continents. So the fact that it doesn't meet this first criteria makes us select that they are different species. A collie and a boxer. They do mate in nature. They have offspring that's normal. And those offspring can also have puppies of their own. So they are the same species. So now that we know the definition of a species, let's talk about how we get new species on Earth. If speciation is occurring, then that simply means that at one time we had one species, but there's been a branching. And now we have two individual species or groups, and they are reproductively isolated from one another. So what this means is maybe they are not mating in nature for some reason anymore. Or if they do, they're not able to produce viable offspring. Or if they do get offspring, those offspring are infertile. So simply the splitting of one species into two is called speciation. So what could have caused the splitting of this species? One, it could have been that some individuals were born with a mutation and the other fruit flies didn't recognize them. And only the ones with the mutations were able to mate with one another. And they make progeny that also have those mutations. And so over time, we're getting two different groups with different traits. And those traits could lead to them not recognizing one another to mate. We could have had some organisms born with mutations that led to aneuploidy. So they have the wrong number of chromosomes. And they're not going to be able to mate with those individuals that have normal chromosomes because their offspring are not going to be viable. But if you have two with the same type of aneuploidy, then you get mating and offspring developing and the birth of a brand new species because they can only mate with one another. Maybe some fruit flies were isolated from other members of the population. And over time, since they're living in slightly different environments, they develop different phenotypes due to natural selection. 
And when they're brought together, they just simply do not recognize one another to mate. So these are just some examples of why speciation could have occurred in this population. Now, there's two major types of speciation that you need to know. There's allopatric and there's sympatric. And before I get into the specifics of them, I'm going to tell you a way to remember what each one is about. First of all, I want you to think of that A as being like a mountain. So you can put a snow peak on that A if you want. And then that S, I want you to remember S means same. So let's talk about allopatric speciation. Speciation has occurred allopatrically. If there's been a separation of two populations by a geographical barrier. So think of like a river or a mountain, like I indicated above, um, or even something that's man-made. A highway now separates this population into two subpopulations. So basically, there's a development of this barrier that restricts gene flow, okay, or the movement of individuals kind of from one population to another population. Because as long as they can move from one population to the next, they're going to interbreed, they're going to have offspring, and they're going to be considered one species. But the Earth is always changing, and we can get these geographic barriers that spring up. And so now we have these populations, and they're isolated from one another. And due to living in different environments, then different traits will be selected for and selected against. And eventually, whenever they're brought back together, if you remove that geographic barrier, then they're so different from one another, they don't even recognize each other to mate. Or they could even have different numbers of chromosomes by that time. It could take hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years for enough difference or diversity to develop between these two populations that speciation is complete. So again, allopatric speciation is whenever you have speciation because of a geographical barrier. Whenever a population develops into two different species while being in the same area. So let's talk about how that could happen. Sometimes sympatric speciation is due to mutations. So we have individuals that were born with a new variation due to mutations. Here's an example. In plants, Remember that failure of meiosis to reduce chromosome number to half can result in organisms that are polyploids. They have double the chromosome number of their parental generation. So the fact that they're born polyploids is considered a mutation. Now this one plant that is foreign can self-fertilize and it can make many seeds, many offspring. And all those offspring are going to be foreign as well. And then pretty soon, whenever those seedlings develop, then you're going to have a whole population of polyploids. And the polyploids can only mate with other polyploids. If a polyploid mates with a diploid, so for example, if the pollen from a diploid try to fertilize the eggs of these polyploids, you're not going to get offspring developing. So polyploids can only mate with other polyploids. Well, there you go. You just had basically the birth of a brand new species because now those two different types of plants are reproductively isolated from one another. They can only mate with other individuals that are like them. Here's an example of sympatric speciation without mutation. Remember, sympatric just simply means that they're living in the same area and something happens to make them reproductively isolated from one another. This is what happened with a type of fly that fed on hawthorns. Hawthorns produce these berries, and they're kind of like tiny little apples. You can see them right here. And so we had a population of flies that were feeding on these hawthorn berries. Well, man introduced apple trees. And some of the fruit flies preferred these apples over the hawthorn berries. So the fact that they were living on two different types of plants, they were eating two different types of food sources, it led to diversity between these two populations until eventually reproductive isolation occurred. They were no longer reproducing with one another in nature. So we say that this was speciation. You now have two species from one. Now, for speciation to occur between two populations, we have to have reproductive isolation. Now, in order for speciation to occur, we must have reproductive isolation 
between two different populations. And as long as reproductive isolation is maintained, so is the fact that we have two different species. So reproductive isolation leads to the maintenance of two different species. If they're no longer reproductive isolated, then they're going to be one species, not two. So that's what we mean by reproductive isolation leads to the maintenance of two different species. So here's some examples of isolating mechanisms that lead to the maintenance of different species. And these are called reproductive isolating mechanisms, and you can just call them RIMS for short. Now, there's two main types of reproductive isolating mechanisms. We have prezygotic and postzygotic. Let's first take a look at the prezygotic RIMS. Since we're talking about before the zygote, we're looking at mechanisms that even stop the formation of the zygote. So prevents the zygote from even forming. Remember, the zygote is the first cell that is formed after the sperm cell fertilizes the egg. So here's some different types of prezygotic RIMS. First, geographical isolation. When you have two populations and they're never near one another, geographically to ever meet and reproduce. So we say that the rabbit here in North America and the Patagonian hare in South America, they're two different species. They never meet in nature to reproduce. And that was the same type of isolating mechanism that we see with tigers and lions, is they're on two different continents, so they're never going to meet to reproduce. So another type of prezygotic reproductive isolating mechanisms is temporal isolation. And this has to do with time. So we have two populations, and they meet, but they never reproduce. So they're considered two different species. One reason why they're not reproducing is they just reproduce at different times of the year. Like with the eastern spotted skunk, they reproduce in wintertime, and these are going to reproduce in springtime. So the fact they're not reproducing in nature means that they're two different species, and they're staying as two different species. Another type is called behavioral isolation. And this is simply when you have members of two different species and they do not recognize each other and the signals that they're giving out when they're wanting to mate. Some common mating behaviors, sounds and calls, and if they do not recognize each other's calls then they will not mate in nature. Some release pheromones and they'll attract the opposite sex, but if you don't have chemoreceptors to receive those signals then you're never going to mate. Specific courtship rituals like the bowerbird so a bird of another species isn't going to recognize him building that bower and that elaborate structure as a signal that he's trying to reproduce. So they're not going to mate in nature. There's mechanical isolation. And it's simply that the reproductive parts of different species sometimes don't fit together. So that's going to prevent successful mating. Now with this type of reproductive isolating mechanism, you could argue that there might be different breeds of dogs that are considered two different species because it's simply that their structures are too different. They're never going to be able to mate because physically it's impossible. And then finally, gametic isolation. So even if the mating attempts are successful, the sperm of one might not be able to fertilize the egg of another. They're just incompatible. So this is preventing the formation of a zygote. And again, all of these that we just mentioned, these are reproductive isolating mechanisms that would stop the formation of a zygote. So that's why they're considered prezygotic reproductive isolating mechanisms. Let's take a look at some postzygotic REMS. This is the other main type of REM. So these are mechanisms that occur after the formation of a zygote. So here's some types. Zygote mortality. The fact that the zygote is not viable and it dies, it doesn't develop into offspring. And remember, in order to say that two organisms are the same species, they have to produce a viable offspring. And the second type of postzygotic RIM is reduced hybrid fertility. So this means that we have offspring, they were viable, they matured to adulthood, but they're infertile. So because of this, that's why the horse and the donkey 
are considered two different species. We don't have the merging of two different species. Now take a second to read through this question and select the correct answer. Here's a question that has to do with reproductive isolating mechanisms. You can see that we're getting offspring. They're just not fully developing. So we can get rid of the prezygotic barriers. We can also get rid of gametic isolation. I'm assuming that means that the gametes can't fuse, but obviously they are since we're getting offspring. So now it's down to A and D, and technically this just comes down to if you know your terms or not. Remember, one of the definitions of species is if you get offspring that are viable, that means can develop and lead normal lives. And so in this situation, we have a postzygotic barrier and the hybrids are inviable. They're not developing, so your answer is D. So now we're going to look at types or patterns of evolution. So we look at the fossil record, and we can see changes in species over time. And depending on the pattern, we say that the species has gone through divergent evolution or parallel evolution or adaptive radiation. So basically, we're using the fossil record to go back and see how these populations and species have changed over time. Let me emphasize, not one pattern is the correct one for all species. It just depends on the species and how they have evolved. If divergent evolution occurred in the past, then this is what we see in the fossil record. We see a common ancestor, and it looks like there is speciation. Again, that can either happen allopatrically or sympatrically. But we end up with two different species, and it looks like over time, species one and species two are becoming more unsimilar to one another. They're becoming more diverse. And eventually they become so diverse in either what they look like or even their behavior that we have two different species. But even though these two species have become more unsimilar over time, they're still going to possess some similarities that was in that common ancestor. And remember, those are called homologous structures. So you need to remember that divergent evolution leads to homologous structures, similar structures in different species due to a common ancestor. And again, I've given you a diagram over here that's showing you that since there was a common ancestor to these different species, we can see these similar structures. So these would be examples of homologous structures due to relatedness. For the next one, parallel evolution. We see speciation, again, either allopatrically or sympatrically. And we see the evolution of two different species, but they're not becoming more diverse from one another. They are two different species, but they're actually acquiring similar adaptations, so they still look very similar to one another. And this could be because they're living in a similar environment and they're trying to acquire similar resources. So they're going to develop similar adaptations to do that. For the next one, this is called adaptive radiation. Now, you can see again, we have a common ancestor, but it looks like in a really short period of time, we don't go from just one species to two different species. We have many different species, species one, species two, three, four. So we're getting rapid evolution from a common ancestor. So let's fill in some information down here about adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation is occurring when there is rapid diversification. And this is occurring in a relatively short period of time. Now, this can occur whenever we have a couple different situations. If new niches become available as individuals are relocated into new areas, we will see adaptive radiation, rapid evolution. So here's an example of that. Off the coast of South America is the Galapagos Islands. And some birds, some finches, flew to the Galapagos Islands and colonized it. Well, imagine if you discover a new island, all of the resources that are available to you. And in this situation, you're going to see rapid evolution as those with variances that are specialized for these unused niches, they're going to be selected for and we're going to see rapid evolution and diversification. Here's a diagram that's showing you adaptive radiation. You can see that we have one common ancestor, and you can get a lot of species from this 
common ancestor in a short period of time. We also see this happen when there's a drastic change in the environment and we have a mass extinction. In the, in the fossil record, we've been able to determine so far five mass extinctions. So we see the end of a lot of species. And we see the end of those species. It opens up their niches. And we'll see rapid diversification of the species that made it through that drastic change in the environment. Sometimes I see a diagram of adaptive radiation. And it looks like this. It kind of looks like an upside down umbrella. And they're just showing you that there was one common ancestor and we get lots of species from that. For convergent evolution, I did have a diagram on the previous page. So we can go ahead and indicate this is showing you convergent evolution. And it's different from these other three because see how we have a common ancestor? Here we have two separate species. So here's species one and here's species two. I want to make sure that you understand. We still have species one and species two. They're not actually coming together to form one species. That's not happening. But over time, we can see they're becoming more similar to one another. So let's take a look at convergent evolution and some species that we say are converging. So again, in convergent evolution, we have two separate species becoming more similar over time but they are not related to one another. They're not splitting from a common ancestor. Now, remember with divergent evolution, this leads to homologous structures. And you need to remember that with convergent evolution, it leads to structures that are called analogous structures. Analogous structures are again, similar structures in different species, but it's not because they're related. It's because these structures evolved independently because those structures are good for the type of environment that organism is living in. So an example of convergent evolution, sharks and dolphins. So we say that they have analogous structures, similar structures, they're unrelated, and it's due to living in a similar environment. So an analogous structure with dolphins and sharks would be their dorsal fins. The dorsal fin of a shark looks like this, and then the dorsal fin of a dolphin looks like this. It's more curved. So again, we see similar structures, but not because there was a common ancestor that had this structure. It's because they live in a similar environment, and this design aids them in that environment. Internally, these structures are not similar. If we would actually look at the structures inside of these dorsal fins, they're not going to look anything alike. It's just on the outside, and that's what this term means, is they look similar on the outside. Another example of analogous structures would be the flippers of penguins and the fins of fish. If we were going to draw that, we would draw probably a flipper looking like this and a fin like this, and they look very similar. And so again, that design is good for that type of environment, for swimming around in the water. It's not because they have a common ancestor. And again, internally, these structures are not similar. And then another example would be wings on insects and wings on birds. Just because they have wings and they fly around does not mean that they're closely related. So these are examples of analogous structures. So you must remember that divergent evolution leads to homologous structures, whereas Convergent evolution leads to analogous structures. Again, homologous structures are similar structures in related organisms due to a common ancestor, whereas analogous structures are common structures in unrelated species and it's due to living in a similar environment. Analogous structures develop independently in a species due to natural selection. This diagram down here is just simply showing you that these would be examples, the forelimbs and the wing of these different organisms and the flipper of the porpoise. We have similar structures. So see how they look similar on the inside and it's due to a common ancestor. Whereas these are considered analogous. Okay, the next pattern of evolution is different from these others because we're talking about two interacting species
So if coevolution is occurring, then that means that these species are evolving adaptations that allow them to continue to associate with one another. So let's talk about some relationships in which species are associating with one another. We talked about mutualism in pre-AP. That is when both benefit from the relationship. So if we see adaptations that develop in flowers, then we're also going to see changes in species that associate with flowers. So for example, bees can only see certain wavelengths. They can only see certain colors. Well, we've seen flowers evolve to be those colors, so they can be pollinated by the bees. And again, I want to make sure you understand that flowers aren't willing themselves to change, to meet those needs so that the bees can see them. It's just simply those that had those variances were the ones that were selected for and became more common in the next generation. We see organisms that are in predator-prey relationships co-evolving. A good example is with the mustard plant and the cabbage butterflies. How did the mustard plant get so bitter tasting? Well, if you think about it, the plants that were producing more bitter oils were the ones that were not getting eaten by the larvae of these cabbage butterflies, and they were surviving and reproducing. So eventually you're going to have just mostly plants that are very bitter because those are the ones that are surviving and reproducing. Well, with the larvae, only the ones that could eat those plants were surviving and reproducing. So we see the evolution of these plants becoming more bitter over time. And in addition, we see the evolution of this butterfly population being able to withstand those more bitter oils that those plants were producing. And then another example is whenever we have organisms that are in a parasitic relationship. So we see evolution of hosts as they're withstanding those parasites, but then we also see evolution of parasites. So they are surviving the defenses of the host. So again, in coevolution, you have two interacting species, and they're evolving adaptations so that they continue to associate with one another over time. Now, I added a question on here that has to do with these different types of structures that you have to know like vestigial structures, analogous structures, homologous structures. So take a second to read through the question and select an answer. So the question states that we have two different species here, and they have a similar structure, and they have similar development. In order for that to occur, they have to share genes. And if organisms have similar genes for development, then it's because they had a common ancestor. So the answer to this question is C. But let's go through some of our other options. First of all, vestigial structures are structures that are present in species but no longer have a use. And we can't really tell whether these bones that they're talking about are bones that are developing that don't serve a purpose. But, so in order for A to be correct, they would have to say that these bone structures are no longer utilized by the species. So A is not an option. B says by the principle of convergent evolution. So that would mean that humans and dolphins are becoming more similar over time. And that's not the case. As a matter of fact, we're diverging. We're becoming more unsimilar over time. So we can cross through B. And if we cross through B, we also have to cross through D because you should know that analogous structures goes with convergent evolution. So if it says that the bones are analogous structures, then that would be due to convergent evolution. And since we eliminated B, that means that we automatically eliminate D. Now I want to talk about some terms related to paces of evolution, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. And I just want you to be familiar with these terms in case you see them on a question. For some species, we see gradual changes over time. Hence why we call it gradualism. So here we have speciation, and we end up with two different species here. And we can see that slowly over time, they're changing. Now, with this second model, it's called punctuated equilibrium. And what we see in this model is that we have, in a relatively short period of time, we have rapid evolution, rapid change of a species, followed by followed by periods of little change. I want to point out that there's not really a, a debate over which model is the correct model showing us the rate of evolution. It just depends on the species. So sometimes we see gradual changes in the species in the fossil record, and sometimes we see rapid change with little change for a long period of time. Now, you need to know that there's been five mass extinctions 
according to the fossil record. You can see them indicated here on the graph. The most recent one was 65 million years ago. And that's when the dinosaurs went extinct. Now you do not have to know when each of these mass extinctions occurred. But if I were you, I would make sure you have one in your pocket for the test. So you can talk about there was a fifth mass extinction 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct. And the most popular theory believed as to why they went extinct is because there was an asteroid that struck Earth. And that would lead to major environmental changes. Now remember, when there's major environmental changes, then that allows for adaptive radiation. The elimination of some species opens up niches for other species that survive that event to have rapid evolution. And you can see that happen right here. So here is the demise of the dinosaurs. And you can see in the fossil record, then it looks like we have major branching of new species of mammals over time. So whatever this event was 65 million years ago, it paved the way for the rapid evolution of mammals. Now I'm sad to report that scientists are saying that we are on the brink of the sixth mass extinction. And unfortunately, it is due to us, human activities. This picture kind of says it all because this is literally a picture of one tree that is left in a rainforest. I think logic would tell you that this area is never going to be able to recover. The reason why so many species are going extinct at this alarming rate is because of habitat destruction. So that is one way that we are causing this mass extinction, is just simply by destroying habitats. And then another way is by polluting habitats. Please remember that most organisms simply cannot move if their habitat is destroyed. They can't just go to a new location. They also just cannot switch food sources. Organisms are highly adapted to the habitat that they're currently living in and the resources that they consume for food. They cannot just go to a new location and find those same resources which reminds us again why variation is so important in populations. Now I've already gone over this in plenty of the other lectures, so I'm not going to take a second to do that, but you do need to remember that one of those advantages to sexual reproduction is it increases variation and increases chances of surviving in a changing environment. And we very much so live on a planet that has constant change. Now, I just talked about how we negatively impact the environment, but we can have positive impacts on the environment, and we'll talk more about this in the ecology unit. But one thing that we can do is we can protect natural habitats. We can also restore the ones to the best of our ability that we have already destroyed. We can also preserve variation by protecting species, not allowing their populations to get so low that we're losing these natural variants that could be beneficial in the future. We have captive breeding programs. We try to increase the population of certain species, and we can make sure outbreeding is occurring so that we are preserving variation in populations, that we're not going to lose those rare alleles due to chance events, due to genetic drift. For this last topic, we're going to get into the origin of life. How did we go from simple inorganic molecules on Earth to eventually these simple life forms that we see in the fossil record. So let's start at the beginning when the Earth was forming. We believe that the Earth contained some simple inorganic molecules like water and ammonia and molecules like methane. And we believe that these inorganic molecules came together to form bigger molecules simple organic molecules. Remember, organic means contains carbon and hydrogen. These simple organic molecules, or monomers, remember we have amino acids. Remember, they're made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. 
and you can see those ingredients right here in these inorganic molecules. We had nucleotides, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, with traces of phosphorus atoms. We have monosaccharides, make up sugars. Again, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and lipids that are mostly carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It is these simple organic monomers that come together and form polymers and macromolecules through dehydration synthesis. So this is how we got our proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. And these are the four organic molecules that make up our cellular structures that come together to make up our cells. I want to take a second to stop and talk about this idea that we believe RNA was the first genetic information. We have a tendency to think that DNA would be since most cells contain DNA as a genetic information, but there is a well-believed theory that RNA was the first to develop. We believe this because of RNA's many different properties. First of all, we know that RNA can act like genetic material. It can store information. It can transfer genetic information because it carries information from DNA to ribosomes. And it also can act like an enzyme. So we say that it's an important catalyst. An enzyme is a catalyst. A catalyst makes reactions occur. So the fact that it has so many diverse functions makes us think that it evolved first. So now that we have organic molecules, we have molecules that can come together and form the different structures of a cell. We can develop a membrane. This membranous structure that you see here can split in two like cells can. It can trap molecules inside them, concentrating them. It can enfold, forming compartments inside the membrane. They can become more complex over time as they acquire more of these structures. They can even allow molecules in and out so they're semi-permeable. Now, these structures that act and are very similar to cells have a name. They're called protobionts. So these are like precursors to cells. They're not cells themselves, but they are very cell-like. Now, we can make these in a lab. We can take those four types of organic molecules, and we can put combinations of chemicals together, and we can get these structures to develop. And they have many different names. You don't have to have these terms memorized, but sometimes we will call them liposomes, coacervates, microspheres. And again, they're like cells, but they're not actually living, but they have many cellular properties. Now, we believe these simple structures, these protobionts that initially formed became more complex over time. And eventually, they formed the first cell. And it would be a prokaryotic cell. So we had the formation of these prokaryotic cells. Now, these first prokaryotic cells were believed to be chemoheterotrophs. That basically means is they consumed molecules as an energy source and as a source of atoms to build other molecules inside their structures. So chemoheterotroph means they consumed molecules. And I want to emphasize this because I think students naturally believe that organisms that could do photosynthesis came first. Now the reason why we think these photosynthesizers came later compared to chemoheterotrophs is because we know when we got oxygen in our atmosphere and that's produced by photosynthesis. So it's these photoautotrophs that evolved later on. They produced the Earth's oxygen. And because we now have oxygen, we form this ozone layer around Earth. And that's protection from UV rays. So we're making it now a more conducive environment for living organisms. It's not as harsh. Now here's an important idea related to this I need you to know. Oxygen was not present on early Earth in the atmosphere. So let's add in the atmosphere. And oxygen in the atmosphere is 
O2 or O3. O3 is ozone. So yeah, there was oxygen atoms, but they weren't in the atmosphere. Now these first cells, these first prokaryotic cells that were doing photosynthesis are very similar to these bacteria that we have. And I believe they're actually the oldest fossils that we can find are cyanobacteria. And we believe the ones that we have today are still very similar to what those original autotrophs look like. They're very simple cells. And something else that we find out about them is they also look very, very similar to chloroplast in plant cells. And I hope this is triggering some ideas that we've already talked about, because remember, we believe that chloroplast evolved from prokaryotic organisms that were able to photosynthesize. And how they came about to be inside of a cell is that they were engulfed by other cells but not destroyed, and they developed a symbiotic relationship. That's not such a crazy thought. I mean, if you think about it, you have organisms living inside of you. You have bacteria that's living inside of you, and it serves a very important purpose. It's manufacturing vitamin K for you, so you both are getting a benefit. So this happens. We see organisms develop mutualistic relationships. So now that we have structures inside of bigger cells, then we have eukaryotic cells. Remember, this is the endo-symbiotic theory of evolution. So we see that cells have acquired structures inside of them, like the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. But we also know that there was infoldings in that cell membrane. And this created the organelles of the endomembrane system. Remember, such things as the smooth ER, the rough ER, the Golgi, the nuclear envelope, so now we have more advanced cells that have evolved, eukaryotic cells, and they're single cells, but we know that cells will come together and form colonies and start to live as a single structure. And they can even become specialized to meet the needs of colonies. And I'm basically describing what happens in a multicellular organism. So we get the formation of multicellular organisms. And we're going to talk more about that because we even see bacteria in your body. Individual cells will come together and they'll form a complex structure. It's good for them, it's bad for you because it's really hard for our antibiotics to kill them whenever they form these plaques. And what's even more interesting is different cells in different areas of this complex will express different genes, making different proteins. It's like they're becoming specialized so that they could perform this common task, which is to infiltrate a certain part of your body and survive there and accumulate and acquire resources. So we know that single cells can come together and form multicellular colonies. There's not many dates you have to know for the AP exam, but here's a few that you should remember. We believe that the Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago, and it was too hostile for life until about 3.9 billion years ago. Now, the earliest fossil that we can find dates back to about 3.5 billion years ago. So we believe that the first living organisms developed about... 3.8 billion years ago. Because we're only on Earth for such a short period of time, it's hard for us to imagine life developing because it's such a slow process. But think about it. It took almost 2 billion years of change on the Earth for this Earth to actually become a planet that could support life. And it took almost half of a billion years for simple cells to form from simple organic molecules. That is a long period of time for small changes to occur over time, forming these very simple cellular structures. Now we need to talk about two researchers, Miller and Urey. And they set up an apparatus that allowed us to see if simple organic molecules could form from some of the inorganic molecules that we thought were present on primitive Earth. Remember, we have to have proteins, carbs, 
lipids and nucleic acids to form cellular structures. So what they were testing is called the primordial soup theory. College Board references it as the organic soup theory. This is a theory that states how cells could have formed. Now we know at one time the earth was completely covered in water and we believe life formed in this watery environment. The chemicals that were in the atmosphere came together. There had to be some form of free energy to provide the energy for these molecules to react and we end up with very simple organic molecules. So here's the apparatus that they created and this is the experiment that they did. They mimicked the conditions of early earth and they ultimately got the formation of these organic molecules like amino acids. So let's discuss this diagram. We had water on earth and we know that the sun can heat up water and it can evaporate up into the atmosphere. We also know that there's gases in the atmosphere. Now what they did is they loaded up this apparatus with the molecules that we thought were present during primitive earth. Methane, ammonia, hydrogen, water, and lightning storms would provide the free energy for the reaction of some of these inorganic molecules to form more complex molecules. Just like on earth now, when gas is cool, then they'll condense and we'll get rain. So that's what this device did is it cooled off this water vapor that would contain these molecules. And this is like the raining down of these molecules into an ocean that covered Earth. Well, here's what they found. When they took a look in this sample of water after a few days, then they found that they had simple organic molecules that had formed in that solution. So this is why it's called the organic soup model. Now we had a soup, a watery soup, that contained organic molecules. There's an important concept to remember, and I've already emphasized this before, but on primitive earth, you've got to remember, there was no atmospheric oxygen. There was no O2 in the atmosphere. Now this is an important idea to know because if you think about it, we have these gases on Earth and we have oceans. How come we don't see the formation of molecules in our oceans like that now? Well now we have atmospheric oxygen and something about oxygen is it actually prevents small monomers coming together to form macromolecules. So in order for these events to occur, for the formation of simple organic molecules from inorganic molecules, oxygen could not have been present on early Earth. The other model I want to mention is called the between the sheets model. And these are sheets of mica that form. And we believe that maybe in sheets of mica, it provided kind of a stable environment and allowed for the aggregation of these simple molecules together so that they could actually form cellular type structures. So be familiar with the organic soup model and also know that there's other models out there that could explain how simple organic molecules formed into simple cells.